And the t- title of today's message is God Has Not Forgotten You. Can you say that with me? God has not forgotten you. He's not forgotten me. You can say that about yourself. God has not forgotten you. I was thinking about, I was thinking about something that happened to me uh, many years ago. Those of you, those of you who, who maybe don't know me or are new here, I was part of a, of a Latin Christian band for many, many years called Contagious. And we did a lot of traveling, a lot of touring in South America, Central America, throughout the States. And one of the beautiful things that we enjoyed, and you can ask Gabby, who was our drummer in Contagious. He's our production director here at church. Ben, who's playing bass today on worship. Uh, he was traveling with us on all these trips. And Pastor Jay from Blue Prince Church and Alex, our guitarist. One of the things that we loved best about touring was that since we were the guests a lot of times, and we were like the guests from, you know, international guests, is that they would take us to great restaurants to eat, right? And so if we were in, in, in Peru, we would have some great Peruvian cuisine. If we were in Argentina, we would have a great asado argentino. If we were, you know, in P- Puerto Rico with Ben's family, Ben's family would feed us in Puerto Rico 10 times every day. And so, and so, and so I remember, I remember we went to this, we were in Colombia. We were in Colombia. Anybody like Colombian food? There's some good Colombian food. And then presence of God is in this place. And, um, and, and, and I'll use this example just because a lot of us are used to, when we get to a restaurant, right, just, just to kind of to tame the lions of hunger inside of us, what do they give us? They give us chips and salsa. We should have brought chips for everybody. I'm sorry, I didn't bring it for you guys. Um, I remember we finished a concert, and generally speaking, after the concert, they would say, oh, guys, are you hungry? And we were all like, yes, we're hungry, and because um, we normally were. And I remember we were all kind of in different, some of us were in a van, other ones were in another car. And I remember when I got to the restaurant, that guy was driving us, I guess stopped somewhere else. And when I got there, there was about 20 people, the, our band, our sound engineer was there, the pastors of the church that had invited us, and some of the leaders and the people that were there. And it was a big table, about 20 people. And I got there kind of last. I was one of the last ones to get there, and I kind of sat in my seat. Everybody already had kind of ordered their, you know, their drinks, their sodas, or whatever, juices, whatever they were going to get. Um, there was chips and sauce on the table. Um, and, and when I got there, I kind of got involved in a conversation with one of the pastors that was there. You know, he was asking me questions about the, the band, about the, our church here in the States and all these things. And I remember that I was like, oh, great, there's chips and salsa. And I was eating chips and salsa. And then little by little, I start, I start seeing they start bringing out meals, okay? I don't know if we have a picture of a bandeja paisa. Has anybody, anybody heard of bandeja paisa? God is good. God is good. God loves us. And so... And so, you know, I see like two or three bandeja paisas come out on the table. I'm like, all right, the presence of the Lord is in this place. And, uh, and, then, and then, you know, a little bit later, and I re- in that moment, in that moment, all I had was my cup of water and my chips and salsa. I was happy about it. But, but it seemed like the, the, the waiter and the waitress that were there, they kind of, I felt like they were forgetting about me because every time they'd walk by, I'd miss them, and then I'm talking in this conversation with the pastor, and then I kind of want to, like, stop, but I didn't want to be rude, and, 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 then, and then more plates come out. Has anybody ever seen this, this bowl of soup from Colombia? It's called ajiaco. Yeah? Ajiaco. I think we're going to eat ajiaco in heaven someday. And so I see some of those come out, and, and you know, you know my, my, my taste buds are opening up, and um, I'm feeling excited, but nobody comes to take my order. I also wanted to have a manzana postobon, which is one of the drinks, one of the sodas from Colombia. And I was like, all right, you know, this is going to come. But nobody would ask me what I wanted. And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I, they had already prayed, or, or maybe they prayed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And, and, and everybody said, oh. Somebody might have said, oh, Virg, what about you? I'm, I'm, I'll be fine. They'll, be, they'll bring it soon. And, uh, and, and I looked, and all of a sudden, every single person had their plate and their drink. And I had my And I kind of put the cup like in the middle like that and kind of like somebody can look that I'm empty and I'm dry. And I felt completely forgotten. I almost started to cry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Has anybody ever experienced something similar to this? Like, like where you're somewhere and you're like, the guy hasn't come back like in 30 minutes to fill my cup, right? Or, or, or you, know, you know, what happened? Everybody else's order is Or they just forgot, like you ordered, but they just forgot to bring it to you. That ever, that ever happened before? And so we've all been, oh, you guys see empanadas, empanadas, right? So, so this is a perfect picture to show you before lunchtime, right? Um, <laughs> so, so all this was all over the table, but my space, my spot was completely empty. And so, <laughs> so all of us have experienced these things. Some of us ex- have experienced being the one that we have our food, and we're like, oh, what, yours will come out soon. Yeah, and you're just eating, right? And, and we've also experienced uh, the, the, the feeling like uh, they forgot me. They forgot about me. 
Um, some of you in your walk with God, in, in your relationship with God, some of you, um, your walk with God has never been better. Right now, you're, you're on the mountaintop peak experience. You're praying. God is answering. You feel God's joy. You open up the word and like, it's like talking to you and you get it and you're applying it in your life. And you, you, some of you right now, you're sitting at the table with your bandeja paisa, with your manzana postobón and everything you need, right? And, and, and some of us, some of us, our walk with God right now could never be worse. Could never have been worse. Some of us right now, we're facing difficult situation, and we don't feel like we're on the top of the mountain. We feel like we're in the valley, trapped. Some of you feel like you're at the table, and everybody else is eating and blessed, and you are stuck with a quarter of a cup of water and chips and salsa. You feel even cheated. Everybody else is being served. Everybody else feels blessed, and you might have even come to the point where you think, God's forgotten me. I, don't, I must not matter. And so no matter where you find yourself, I think this message is important for all of us. Because if you are in a high point right now and you're feeling great, I, let me just, I don't, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but there will be a point where we all feel forgotten. There will be circumstances that are challenging or difficult. And if you are going through a difficult valley right now, feeling that you've been forgotten, I believe that God's word has something to lift you up today. I believe God's word has the possibility of encouraging us today. We're all going to have moments at the top of the mountain. We're all going to have moments deep in the valley. That's not the question. The question is not, are we going to have valley moments? That's not the question. <clears throat> because sometimes we have this wrong impression that, oh, I'm a Christian now. I don't have problems. <laughs> it's, that doesn't work that way. We live in a fallen world. So the question is not, will we have valley moments the question is, how do we respond and react when we find ourselves in adverse circumstances? And the key, what God's word challenges us to over and over is to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. And we stop focusing and fixing our eyes on our problem that we're facing. We need to focus on what God wants for us, how he can get us out of it. And when we focus on the who and not the what, we begin to understand that God has a purpose even through the valleys of life. And so even though our problems sometimes change, we change, circumstances change, I want to remind you that God never changes. So before we get into the word, can I just pray and ask God to speak to us through his word today? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask you to speak to our hearts today, Lord. Today there's a lot of us that are here that are feeling strong and good. Some of us are feeling weak and empty, Lord. But no matter where we are, you, you and your word find us. I pray, Lord, that the seeds of truth of your word would be planted in, in the hearts and lives of every one of us here and watching online, that, that the soil of our hearts would be fertile, and that those seeds would grow, flourish, and give much fruit. We pray for this in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. If you have your worship guide, the first verse in there is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. This is a great verse to not only memorize, but to have in your heart. And this is what it says. It says, Jesus Christ, help me out, is the same yesterday and today and forever. One more time. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, now here's, here's what I find. I find that most of us are in agreement with two-thirds of this verse most of the time. <laughs> There's one-third of it that's challenging for us. I think most of us are in agreement with the first part. And you can fill out that first blank with me in the worship guide if you want to follow along. Uh, we're in agreement with, with this statement. Jesus Christ was great back then. When we think about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we, we read the stories of who Jesus was and what Jesus did back then, we're in agreement. Jesus Christ was great back then, right? We, 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 when we understand who and how Jesus was, uh, do we agree that we've, we've all seen people change and we ourselves have changed? Do we agree with that? The difference with Jesus is that he's never changed. He is the same when? Yesterday and today and forever. We can all recognize when we read about him, man, Jesus was great back then. Jesus did great things in those times. Jesus walked on water. Jesus healed the sick. He gave sight back to the blind. He raised a few dead people. 
Jesus took a kid's happy meal and fed 5,000 men and their families. He supersized it. He walked on water. He did, Jesus did amazing things. He, he set and delivered people who were captive, oppressed, and possessed by demons. Like he set people free. He broke chains. He loved on people. And not only the stories that we read in the Bible, but we can also look back at what he's done in many of our lives. Remember what he did five or ten years ago when you accepted him? When he rescued your life, when he reached your family, when your parents gave their life to the Lord and you kind of followed? Do you remember that? When he healed you in that moment of sickness, when he, when he broke a chain in your life? You remember? And we can agree, man, Jesus was great back then. The second part that we in agreement is the third part of the verse, kind of skipping the middle part. We would all agree with number two, Jesus Christ will be great when we get to heaven, right? Jesus Christ will be when in the future we can believe this, we can agree with this, we can agree with the fact that Jesus Christ will be great when, he, when we get to heaven, because is it not true that this is one of the greatest promises that we believe in and believe for? Heaven, right? That the kingdom of heaven is going to be something amazing? Everybody that I talk to wants to go to heaven, even if they don't believe in God. <laughs> one day in heaven... I'm going to reunite, be reunited in heaven, right? Even people who don't believe in God or, or his word, people want to go to heaven, and it's, iron, it's ironic because everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That's one of life's ironies. Because the only way to get to heaven is when we die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. For, for all of us that have believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, our hope is the reward of heaven. Can I get an Amen. That one day we will be in this incredible place where there is no injustice, where there's no sorrow, where there's no pain, where there's no fear, where there's no sin, where there's no sickness, where there's no poverty, where there's no suffering, where there's no hurt. And everything that's wrong with this world will not be wrong there, where there's no corrupt governments and corrupt presidents and lying and stealing because we'll be in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our God, our Lord of Lords. And nobody will have a problem proclaiming God's greatness and how good Jesus is. When? Then. So we don't have issue believing that Jesus Christ was great back then. We don't have a problem believing that Jesus Christ will be great when we get to heaven. The tricky part is point number three. Fill that out with me. Jesus Christ is good right now. And so, and so again, it's easy to say amen when we feel like things are going well. But when I say Jesus Christ is good right now and you're going through a challenging, adverse circumstance, it's kind of hard to say amen. This point is tricky for a lot of people, for a lot of us when we're going through struggles. Accepting this, that Jesus Christ is good right now, Again, we, we, we can see that he was good back then. We can see that he's going to be good in the future, in heaven. But, but now, you might say, Pastor Reg, you don't know what I'm going through. And you're absolutely right. You might not know what I'm going through. We don't, and despite that, I, I don't know what you're going through, and I believe you, but spiritual maturity is when you and I begin to understand that our circumstances do not change Jesus Christ's character. Do you understand? My circumstances, whether good or bad, whether peaceful or rough, do not tra change the character of who Jesus Christ is. We tend to confuse this. Why? Because we change ourselves. But we learn in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. But what if my circumstances change? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. But what if I'm not joyful, I'm not happy, I'm not feeling peace today? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. But what if nobody's coming to feed me, Pastor? What if I'm empty and they forgot about me? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our circumstances change. We change. We're happy. We're sad. We're up. We're down. But Jesus is the same. And there's something powerful in the stability of Jesus and the stability that it can bring to our lives to understand that none of what happens in our lives affects or impacts the character of Jesus Christ. 
Unfortunately, our character wavers and fluctuates. Pastor Virgil, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that when we're up in the pinnacle top, mountaintop moments of life and everything's going great, guess what? Jesus Christ is good and he is great and he is faithful. And what I'm saying is when we're down in the valleys of life, in the darkness of life, in the, in the isolation, in the worst moments of life, Jesus Christ is good and he's great and he's faithful. No matter where I find myself in life, no matter what position of the mountain I'm on, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, and today and forever. And that means that he is good and he's great and he is faithful because his character is not shaken by my circumstances. That's why, my, that's why I have to find my strength in him and not myself. Sometimes this is a difficult truth to accept. There's, there's this man in the Bible, John the Baptist. You guys, most of us have heard of John the Baptist. Well, if, if you haven't learned more about him, uh, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He was his first cousin. And um, he is one of the Bibles, uh, one of the heroes that we find in the New Testament in the Bible. Uh, John the Baptist, because he was Jesus' cousin, grew up with Jesus. He knew Jesus well. Um, and I want us to read a little bit about a very key moment in John the Baptist's life. So, by the way, John the Baptist kind of grows up, and he... He has a calling as a prophet uh, of God, as a messenger of God, and he's bringing this message of repentance. That's, John the Baptist would preach about repentance, and he would, he would invite people to take a next step in their walk with God by, by repenting and being baptized, which is a symbolism of new life. The old me goes under the water, the new me emerges in a new life. And so John the Baptist is like in a high point in his ministry. How high is it, Pastor Verge? John chapter 1, verse 29. Read with me. John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, here's the famous words from John. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why did John say this about Jesus? Remember, in those times before Jesus, the only way that people would receive forgiveness of their sins was with the shedding of blood. Shedding of what blood? Of a worthy animal sacrifice, which in most cases was a pure, perfect, without blemish lamb, right? This is, this is what they would do. We, we see this even when, we, when, the, when the people of Israel celebrate Passover. It's part of the process. The, 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 the slaughtering of a lamb, the shedding of the blood, the placing it on the altar, right? In order to receive forgiveness of sins. And John says of Jesus, behold, the what? The lamb of God that takes the sin away, the sin of the world. Because the only way that our sins could ever have been forgiven was with the shedding of the blood of a perfect without blemish, worthy sacrifice who was Jesus on the cross. That's why the fact that he shed his blood was so important because that's what allows us to be able to receive forgiveness when we accept Jesus as, a, as our Lord and Savior. So, so John, in this moment, John the Baptist, is so excited and, and, and captivated by Jesus that he says this great declaration. He had no problem identifying who Jesus was in this moment. Can we, get, can we be clear on that? He had no problem declaring what he declared. Look at verse 30. He says, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. So John the Baptist is trying to say that all this that I've been talking about to you guys is all about this guy. It's all about Jesus. And, and you have to understand John the Baptist is in the, in the most successful peak season of his ministry, life, uh, of, of his leadership. He's got disciples that follow him. And the people are coming to hear him every day. People are getting baptized. John the Baptist is up on the mountain. He's sitting at the table with his bandeja paisa. Everything he needs, he is well served. Nothing is, he does not feel forgotten. He is up on the top of the mountain. Things are going good. And look what it says in verse 32. It says, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him, speaking of Jesus. And it says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this guy right here, this guy is the son of of God. John is declaring boldly and faithfully and clearly without a shadow of a doubt 
Jesus is the man. Jesus is the God man. Jesus Christ is the one we've been waiting for. And he's referring to this moment when John is baptizing Jesus, one of the most incredible experiences in John the Baptist's life, one of those moments where he's on the top of the mountain. Can, can I say something? It's not hard to, to praise and to worship and to recognize God when we're on the mountaintop. It's, it's actually, it's kind of easy and even fun because when, when everything's going good, amen, like when you're, sitting, when you're sitting at the table and you have your ahiaco in front of you soup, right, it's easy to say, God is good all the time and all the time. It's, it's easy to say that when you feel remembered and not forgotten, when you feel like you're on the top of the mountain. It's easy to feel that way when your baby's born and he's healthy. Praise God. God is so good. It's easy to feel that way when the job you've been applying for and wanting for so long and, and that, that deal that you've been waiting to go through goes through. It's easy to say, God is good. It's easy to praise and to, and to be clear on what we think about Jesus Christ when, when the tests come back with good report from the doctor. And, and so John the Baptist confesses who Christ is clearly and boldly and identified him in this high mountaintop moment of his life. Now, now remember, John the Baptist was a prophet, which means he was, he, was a, he was a person chosen by God to be a messenger, to bring message from God to people. And, and because he was a prophet of God, he always spoke the truth. And he always spoke the truth when God wanted him to speak the truth. And a lot of times people don't like to hear the truth. Why? Because the truth hurts sometimes. And so a lot of times when a prophet would speak, sometimes it would be a message from God as a warning. Sometimes it would be a, a, a correction from God or it would bring conviction. And so in those times there was this king that was ruling, King Herod, right? And this King Herod was not uh, a good king. He didn't really fear God or love God. Um, Herod uh, was committing adultery. And John the Baptist, as a prophet of God, God was sending him over and over to come and kind of point at Herod and say, Herod, you're committing adultery. Like he was, he, he, John the Baptist was coming to Herod and, and telling him, because God was asking to do so, you're committing adultery, you're committing adultery, until finally King Herod got sick of it and he sent John the Baptist to jail. There's a lot of other circumstances, right? And, and so remember... When John the Baptist was in his mountaintop moment, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. This is the Christ. This is the one we've been waiting for. But we see a different story in Matthew 11. Let, let, let's jump to Matthew 11. In Matthew 11, remember the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell a lot of the same stories. Or they tell, they tell um, consecutive stories. It's from four different perspectives, four different writers. But a little bit later, after that had happened, after that whole uh, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, Jesus begins his ministry. Jesus begins to go throughout, you know, doing what he does. And, you know, John kind of continues his thing too. And then at one point, John the Baptist confronts Herod. They put him in jail. So Matthew 11, verse 1, John is in jail and he starts catching, he starts hearing about what Jesus is doing. And it says, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison there, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples. So John sent his own people that were following him, his disciples, to ask Jesus. Look what he asked. Hey, guys, go ask Jesus. Go ask Jesus. Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? It's probably like, really like, like, like just ask him just really softly. Like, are you, are you the one, Jesus? Are, are you the one? Or, or, or is there somebody else? Is it me or do we, are we seeing a different John from John chapter 1 here? This is a different John the Baptist from John 1 that we're seeing in Matthew chapter 11. Because in John 1, we saw a, an, we saw a, a pumped up, confident, bold John the Baptist identifying and declaring cle clearly who Jesus was. But now when his circumstances that he's in jail... He's not making this bold, strong declaration about Jesus. He's actually asking a question to Jesus saying, was I mistaken? Is it you or is there somebody else that's going to come? Because John had an expectation. You can fill out this next blank with me. 
When we're in jail, that is when we tend to question God's character. Pastor, I've never been to jail. It's a symbolism, okay? <laughs> when you're in a tough moment, a bind in life, that is when we tend to question God's character. All of us have had moments where we feel trapped. We've all been there. In fact, you might be there right now. And the question in your mind is, has this been worth it? Has it been worth it to follow Jesus? Has it been worth it that I've been coming to church for the last seven years? Has it been worth it to come with my parents and believe in Jesus? And a lot of times when we're in these circumstances, we question not only ourselves, but we question and doubt God. Has it been worth it to seek God and love God and look for God? Because all I'm experiencing right now is I feel forgotten. Everybody else got their plate. Look at them. They're doing great. Look at her kids. Her kids aren't going through the issues that my kids are going through. Look at their marriage. They're doing wonderful. What about us? It's got chips. We feel like we got the short end of the, end of the stick. We feel... Like God's forgotten us. And we begin to doubt. We begin to question. We begin to fear. I'm sure that if we sat down, every single one of us sat down and had an opportunity to tell our story, all of us here could just tell a story of when we've felt broken, when we've felt misunderstood, when we've felt rejected or abandoned, fearful, doubtful, Sometimes we don't feel that God is good. Sometimes we hear somebody else say, God is good, and we're like, mm, I don't know about that. Keep it to yourself. All the time, not right now. Sometimes we're going through moments, and we ask ourselves, or we ask God, God, really? Like, you're allowing this? Am I the only one that's been there? Like, God, you're allowing this to happen to me? Now, to happen to my kids, now, to happen to our marriage, now, to happen at church, you're allowing this for real? How is that good? How are you good? Because, because we believe that since our character changes, and we believe because our circumstances change, we believe that he changes. And yet we need to remember Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. When things are going good up on the top on the mountain, when things are going bad down low in the valley and everywhere in between, that never changes how good, great, and faithful Jesus Christ is. Maybe you find yourself in a circumstance in your life right now and you're not sure what's going to happen. You know, you know, I think of the, of the real life situations and circumstances. You know, I think right now of, uh, uh, of these married couples who have been trying to have a baby for years. That might be your story. And you've been trying to have a baby for years, and you're, and, and, and like you want to celebrate, and you want to say God is good, but then, you know, you have your friend, and they're having their baby, and, and you know, and then this other family, they just literally got married, and, and they're having twins. And you're over here for seven years trying, and you're like, all I got is chips and salsa. Like everybody else is getting their portion. What about us? Maybe you lost a loved one recently. There's a brother from our, from our church that right now is out of town. He lost, he lost his mother. And, and there's no words that we can say that can compensate for the feeling of loss or the feeling of sadness when you lose somebody that you love. But, 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 but it might be hard to respond all the time when somebody says God is good when you're going through that. Or when you've been diagnosed with something un unexpected or your kid's been diagnosed with something unexpected and then you feel... Why has everybody else served and you forgot me? You forgot me. Like my cup is empty. Or you've been waiting for that job and, and it's crazy because you just see everybody else celebrating their victories. And wow, that person, you know, doesn't even have as much experience as me in this. And look, they have a job. And, and, and all these things, and doubt and everything comes into my mind. And look, and how come they're, you know, how come his life is so good? Look, he has no, no issues with school. And he has no issues with getting along with friends. And he has no issues with his parents. And how come, you know, but I'm stuck here. My chips and salsa. And, and, and. And, and these thoughts and these emotions invade our soul, and we ask ourselves, is God good? Is God really good? And so I'm not sure what, what it might be with you, 
But all I know is that you can fill out the next blank. We all will face circumstances in our lives that will cause us to doubt God, that God is good. All of us will face circumstances in our lives that will cause us to doubt that God is good. And, and, I'm, and I'm talking about every single one of us. No matter what season of life we're in, no matter how old we are, no matter how good or how bad, no matter how, how great things have been, we will all face circumstances in our lives that will cause us to doubt God. And so the question is, what are you going to do in those moments? What, what did John do? John asked, Jesus, is it you? Because I'm not sure about it. Because Jesus feels, Jesus, it feels like I'm sitting at the table and nobody's, come, nobody's remembered me, that I'm here. And you know what, Jesus? Jesus had an answer for John. You want to know why Jesus had, a, had an answer? Because Jesus always has an answer. And, and look, I want you guys to see that, that, in other words, Jesus always has an answer, but Jesus' answer is not always the answer that we're looking for. <laughs> and look what, it, what Jesus responds in Matthew 11, verse 4, when, when he responded to these disciples of John the Baptist that came to him to ask him. He says in, in John, uh, Matthew 11, 4, I'm sorry. He says, Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. What, what is it that you're hearing and seeing? That the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Verse 6, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me, says Jesus. Now, I want you to realize something, something interesting. When Jesus says all these phrases about the blind see and the lame walk and all, when he says all these things, it's actually a direct reference to the messianic or, or prophecies about the Savior to come, the messianic prophecies that are in the book of Isaiah chapter 61. We don't have time to go there right now, but you guys remember Isaiah 61 where I've been anointed, you know, to bring good news, to the, right? And, and, and basically he, Jesus references all of these prophecies except he leaves one out when he's talking to John. He talks about all of them that are in Isaiah 61 except he doesn't mention the one that says, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Interesting that he left that one out when he's speaking to, responding to John, who is precisely in prison, captive. In other words, Jesus' response to John the Baptist was, I continue to be Jesus Christ, the Messiah, but I'm not necessarily going to free you or deliver you from this prison. Okay? And what, what he's trying to show John the Baptist and what he's trying to say to us right now in 2019 is I might not be changing your problem, but I'm going to help you to change your perspective. In fact, that's the next blank. I want you to write it out with me. Many times what we want is for Jesus to take away our problem but what he is trying to do in those difficult moments is trying to change our perspective. This is a good word for some of us today. Do we agree that what, most of the time what we want him is to, to, to take away the problem, right? That's what we want him to do. And a lot of times Jesus may not take away the problem. He needs us to change our perspective. And fill out the next blank. God confirms to us, and this is what, he, this is what God, if God, if we could hear his voice, he would say, I am good and I might not deliver you from your prison, but I will deliver you through it. In other words, I might, I might not do it the way that you want me to do it, but I'm going to be with you in the process and in the journey. You're not going to be alone. And even though I don't take away the problem in your life, I promise to be with you through it. And that's the miracle, that every time we want Jesus to set us free from prison, and, and you know what? There's stories in the Bible that Jesus does set them free from prison, right? We've seen it. God, Jesus can do it. He's demonstrated it. But many times in life, he's not going to deliver us from our prison, but he will deliver us through our prison. Because you know, you know what happened to John the Baptist after this whole situation, right? Did they cut his hair? Yeah. They cut his head off. And you, and you know, you know, you want to know what's interesting, and, and, and thankfully we're not, we might not be in these exact circumstances, but the moment his head was cut off, 2 Corinthians 5 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord when you know Christ. And so John the Baptist saw Jesus more clearly than he ever saw him in that moment. He was in God's presence, healed, complete, 
having accomplished his mission. And in that moment, in the presence of God, he probably heard the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Because we all want to get to heaven. We just don't. We just don't want to die. We all, we all want to be taken out of prison, but we don't realize that sometimes Jesus can deliver us through our prison and our circumstance. This is, I don't know about you, but this is the God that I serve. He wants to walk with us through our problem. Sometimes he won't necessarily change our problem or take it away how we want him to do it, but he will change our perspective. Because, because why? Because he continues to be good and faithful and great, even though our circumstance is bad and poor and ugly. doesn't matter what we've gone through. It doesn't matter what we're going through. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. No matter where we are on our emotional scale, he is good, he is great, and he is faithful. And I know this isn't always easy. I was talking to a friend recently. He was telling me just the challenges and the difficulties going on through on a personal level. It's not easy. Walking with, walking with, with a married couple in these last couple of weeks, going through probably the darkest thing they've ever gone through in their, in their marriage and just praying with them and believing with them and for them. But right now, it's hard for them. I was talking, for, talking with another person, taking care of their elderly parents who have lost their cognitive abilities and battling with Alzheimer's and don't remember and become combative and aggressive. That's hard. It's hard to go through that and to care for that and to go through that and to feel like, man, really, God? Like, this is... And, and so, and so here's, here's what I want to just kind of give a little bit of permission to you and to all of us. You can admit your fears and you can admit your doubts and you can share your struggles with the Lord. In fact, there's freedom from that. If you're a believer and you've been a believer for a while, you might have a hard time admitting your doubts of, of God because sometimes we believe that we're bad Christians if we have doubts or we're bad Christians if we struggle with challenges or we feel like we're bad Christians if, if we're not always, you know, extremely positive about every, every situation. And the truth is we see it throughout the Psalms. With these, we see the psalmist opening up his heart to God. We see Job in the book of Job opening up his heart and saying, God, I need you. I'm broken. I'm, I'm, I'm weak. I can't do this. I'm doubting, I'm struggling, and, and it's okay for us to share. It's okay for us to find ourselves with doubt and fear, but it's not okay for us to remain there. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need his strength. Holy people don't have doubts. No, we're, we're human beings just like everybody else. <clears throat> John the Baptist probably felt horrible after he admitted his doubt to Jesus, right? Don't you think? Like after he had already sent his disciples to go ask Jesus the question, he's probably thinking, what am I doing? They're asking Jesus if it's really him. Oh my gosh, I'm a fool. He's going to hate me. But look what Jesus says in Matthew 11, 11. Soon after this, continuing on the story, Matthew 11, 11, Jesus says, truly I tell you, check this out, among those born of women, in other words, human beings, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said this about John the Baptist even after John the Baptist sent his disciples to question Jesus out of doubt. I think that it pleases Jesus when we're sincere and open and honest and when we don't fake things with him. And I, knew, I know that many of us here need to hear this today because many of Many of you are trying to be strong in your own strength, but let me tell you, there's, a fi there's, a, there's an end point to your strength. There's a, y your strength is finite, <laughs> and so is mine. And, and when we try to do things in our own strength and understanding, we will always reach our limit. And a lot of us have maybe reached it before. And what the Lord wants us to know is that we can trust him and we can share our burdens and release them upon him. Point number four, if you fill that out, will be point number four. This is what I want you to hear today. Jesus Christ is greater than my problem. My problem is big. I understand. But Jesus Christ is bigger. This circumstance is a horribly great. Awful. Jesus Christ is greater. He's bigger. He is greater than what you are going through. He is greater than what I am going through. And praise God 
If everything is going good in your life right now, praise God. But let me tell you, you might find yourself with chips and salsa in a little bit. Feeling forgotten, it happens. You might find yourself feeling like you're in a prison. I'm going to tell you the truth about, about your problems right now. In these last 35 minutes that we've been here in this message, your problems haven't changed. But maybe your perspective has. In this 40, 35, 40 minutes here, my problems haven't changed. But God, through his word and through his Holy Spirit, can change my perspective, which will change my response and rather than falling in despair and frustration and doubt and fear, I can turn that around and find a confidence in the fact that even though I change and my circumstances change, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I love the story in Exodus chapter 3, and I'll close with this. You remember Moses? Moses is out, you know, doing what he's supposed to be doing, and then this bush gets on fire, and God speaks, begins to speak to Moses through this burning bush. You guys remember the story, right? And what, and what, the, what the bush, what the voice of God speaks to Moses is, hey, hey, Moses, I need you to go tell the people of Israel, my people, your people, tell them that I'm going to set them free from slavery in Egypt. You guys remember the story, right? God tells him that. And Moses wasn't this confident leader at that time. Moses says, God, if, if they ask who's sending me, what should I say? You guys remember what he said? God says, if, if they ask you who's sending you, tell them that I am sent you. I am. Everybody say, I am. I am. Note that God didn't say, tell them that I was is sending you. God didn't say, tell them that I will be is sending you. God said, tell them that I am is sending you. Pastor, what does this have to do with my situation and my issues that I'm going through? Well, I believe that God's name speaks to your situation and mine alike. Because when God proclaims his name, he's proclaiming that he is who he says he is and that he is doing what his word says he does. And he says to you, I am with you. He says to you, I am the one that will never, never leave you or forsake you. I am the one who has called you. I am the one who gave you a name and has given you purpose. I am the one who strengthens you. I am the one that sustains you. I am the one that will never leave you or forsake you. I am the one that began a good work in you and will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. I am the one who lifts you up when you are down. I am the one who strengthens you when you are weak. I am the one who breathes life into you when you are dead spiritually. I am the one that opens the doors that nobody else can close. I am the one who always has been and who is and who will always be. And he says that to you today and he speaks it into your problem. He speaks it into my adverse circumstance. He speaks it into our prison. He speaks it into our empty table. And while you and I feel forgotten by God, while you and I feel not loved by God, while you and I feel like everybody else has their portion, everybody else has their feed, everybody else has their blessing, but me, I'm empty. My family, my marriage, my church, this is all, it's all a mess for me. I don't know if God is good. I don't know if it's Jesus. And so I wonder how many times we're struggling with this. Are you struggling with this? Are you struggling with consistently doubting if God loves you or if he hears you? Or if this is, is it even worth it to go to church? Should I even serve? I mean, what is the big deal? I mean, nothing is happening. And so, and so here, here's, here's what I want to do. I really believe in my heart that some of us are suffering from chips and salsa syndrome. We wouldn't put it in those terms, but some of us are feeling forgotten. And so what I want to do is I want to pray for you today. Before, before the last prayer where I kind of invite anybody who wants to make a decision to accept Jesus and kind of take a new step towards God, not religion, relationship, that, that, I'm going to ask to do that after. But just I just want to pray over everybody who's here and everybody who's watching because I really believe in my heart that some of us feel like that forgotten t- seat at the table. We feel like that, that forgotten family or the forgotten marriage or we feel like, like God maybe doesn't care or doesn't love or... We don't matter. So close your eyes, bow your heads. Lord, I pray right now for every man, woman, and young person in this auditorium and watching online. 
I pray, Lord, that you would remind each and every one of us today that not only are you with us, but you are for us and you love us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak into every one of our situations declaring, I am. I pray that we would believe it. I pray that we would receive it. I pray that you would speak into every broken and fractured marriage right now. I pray that you would speak into every uh, report of, of a, of a diagnost medical diagnostic with a bad report right now of, 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 of cancer or sickness or anything else. I pray that, we would, that you would speak into it, I am, and that we would believe it because you have never changed, Lord God. I pray that you would speak into our hearts when we're broken because of the loss of a loved one or when we're, when we're straining and frustrated because of the loss of a job or, 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 or little resources or no job, I just pray, Lord, that you would speak into the circumstances of every young person struggling with depression and anxiety and, and, and all kinds of, of emotional frustrations, of mental uh, um, heaviness and spiritual brokenness, Lord, I pray that you would speak into our situations, into our lives, into our families, into our church. Speak, I am, and we believe it, Lord, because although we change and our circumstances fluctuate up and down, Jesus Christ, you are the same yesterday and today and forever, and so we lean into you and we trust you, God. I pray that you would bring strength where we need it, hope and trust and faith where we need it. I pray that you would replace with light all of the darkness and with life, all of the death. Do what only you can do, Jesus Christ. Work in us. Heal us. Restore us. Strengthen us. We seek it in you. Not from ourselves. Not from our resources. Only in you. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray.